This is the second volume of Jadili uh, panels that we are hosting for Century Electronic Academy, Electronic Music Academy. Um, today, uh, thanks to Goethe and GIZ, we are bringing you a conversation about culture. Uh, we are going to talk about East African culture specifically, um, but more broadly, uh, ethical issues behind sampling, music production, and using traditional instruments, traditional culture. Uh, we have today Tabu Osusa, founding director of Ketebo. Uh, Ketebo is a nonprofit that documents, preserves, and promotes Kenya's diverse musical tradition. They're active in East Africa more broadly. Um, you might know one of their projects, Singing Wells. Um, please, a little round of applause for Tabu. Um, and w would you like to add anything to that, uh, to the introduction I just made? <laughs> Not really. I mean, uh, Singing Wells, uh, which was East Africa recording uh, traditional music, which I think is very important for you guys who are doing electronic music, before it disappears. So far, we have done nearly all uh, traditional groups in Uganda, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, and now I want to head to Rwanda and Burundi. Now that East Africa includes uh, DRC, who knows? We might gonna record the pygmies. They have good, fantastic music. Thank you, Tabu. Uh, next, I'll introduce Kasiva Mutua, uh, recording artist, percussionist, um, and performer. Would you add anything, Kasiva, for your introduction? Ted Fellow. Ted Fellow. <laughs> I can't believe I missed that one. <laughs> Round of applause for Kasiva, please. Thanks for joining us, Kasiva. Uh, and finally, Fiston Lusambo. He's an artist, musician, and producer. He's also a member of Afriqua, uh, a group uh, based in London. You may have heard their music. I certainly have played their tracks in my DJ sets. Uh, my name is Justin. You all know me from SEMA, um, the extracurricular activities which we host for you all. I want to start off the conversation um, with our driving question, who owns culture? I personally don't like to think about culture as something that is owned by anyone, but we do have to think about the ethical implications of um, cultural appropriation, uh, compensation of artists. So these are the subjects we'll be able to get into. Um, I'd start with a, a, a broad question, and maybe I can ask um, starting on on your left uh, with Kasiva, I would ask, uh, and then uh, Fiston and, and Tabu can also chime in, what is the role of live performers within the new wave of electronic music, including pop music that we, um, that we hear on the radio today? Has the role of live performers changed with the evolution of technology and media? Thanks. Um, <coughs> first, as a live performer and as an instrumentalist, I'm called upon by a lot of electronic musicians to contribute or to be able to record percussion or give my input as an artist to their creations. I think it's really important uh, because, see, for you to be able to create or produce music that relates or chimes with where you're from, then I think you have to go back to their roots. And their roots is exactly where you said, where the culture is and where the culture, um, and, and the, the people who hold the culture true to themselves. For example, um, if you are to create a beat in Germany, for example, and somebody here would create a beat, but create a beat influenced by where they're from, they would sound totally different. And I think that X factor, that thing is what gives, um, sort of like, it, it sort of gives it the oomph or the identity of where the music is from. And I think that is also what gives it this thing we call richness. It's what, um, relating your culture in what you're creating and as much as you're living in the now and living with a lot of influences always relating what you're creating 
to where you're from or um, what you hear or actually what you collect when traveling because I believe culture is very dynamic. It keeps changing and um, it's never stagnant. So with what with the influences that you get, if you chime that in with your creations that you're able to create something new and new and you can see even like in pop music now a lot of the big pop artists are going back to the roots to find influences to find these little things that influence their, their songs um for example let's take beyonce for example she um, researches the african continent very deeply and we can we can clearly see that we can hear that in her creations currently and that that i think for the biggest pop musicians to be doing that needs to be sending a message that there's something here and we need to um dig deeper and research and feel deeper for our creations to be as rich as um as rich as the trends because the trends actually going back to the roots, the trends are actually going backwards. Right now, um, these tops were like very old school and now they're the in thing. Um, right now, those hipsters that have like very, you know, uh, broad um, bottoms, flare are back. Uh, Mangolova, if you know what I mean, are back. So that means then it, it's as if the, the now is what was 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 considered back then it's also almost, it's almost as if the trends are reversing themselves yeah it's a and cycle if, yeah and if that is so then um um traditional music that people used to jam to is actually coming back to relevance right now we need to look at these things clearly and deeply and see what can we tap in culture to influence what we're creating now yeah i really feel that um especially what you said about the richness that traditional musicians and live performers bring. Um, I've even noticed YouTube tutorials, which a lot of electronic music producers use when they're stuck or trying to add something. Now tutorials are showing you how to make the notes that you're adding into your DAW sound more natural, more like it's a live musician playing it. Um, maybe I would ask one of you to pass the microphone to Fistan so he can tell us um, from your side, what do you think um, the role of the uh, traditional or just simply the live musician is within the new era of electronic music that we have now? Thank you. I think uh, the role of live music is very important. Even if you do uh, electronic music, you need to have a, b a basic of knowledge of live music. And also, you, do, you have to know that music, when you do music, you are, are you doing for people to dance? Or you are making music you don't think? First, you have to know music express the mood of life. When someone is happy, you play something happy. When someone is sad, you play something sad. So also, making people dance, there are so many beats. Those, there are many beats, especially, I say about Congo, because I'm originally come from Congo. I know in my tribe there are many kind of beat many rhythm many different instrument which we can use but as we only see guitar we only see bass we can't see what he has been presented to us but we have got instrument we can make a music so, in short, live music is very important for electronic music. Definitely. Tabu, would you, would you add anything to that? Um, and after this round of questions, um, obviously I, I, we want all of you to be able to participate. So if you want to ask a question to the panelists, just raise your hand and um, we'll, we'll put your question to them, yeah? Tabu, um, what is the role of live performers within this new wave of electronic music and 
pop music generally? Um, <coughs> hello, millenniums <laughs> and, gener and Generation Z. I'm a baby boomer, so you, you can guess how old I am. I think uh, uh, live performance is very, very important, especially at this uh, stage, at this moment, at this uh, uh, era. During our days when we had bands, like um, let's say in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, each band had its own identity. I remember the other day I was telling somebody about the band. They said, what's the band? I said, okay. <laughs> yeah, they told me. <laughs> yeah, so we had bands, maybe Wanyika, maybe Virunga, maybe Hody Boys, maybe the Mighty Cavaliers. I mean, they're all in that book, by the way. They all had an identity because they performed live. So each person, if he's playing guitar or doing uh, maybe sax or trumpet, they have their own identity. So you could easily identify this is band X or this band Y. Right now, it's getting very difficult. It's going very murky because you, you, there, there are hardly any bands anymore. See, because uh, the role that most uh, DJ, uh, electronic DJs play is almost the role that the, the backup band used to play. So you see, and if you're not careful, like all of you are students of, uh, of maybe one class, you might end up sounding the same. And that's very dangerous. And that's why you see, for you to succeed, take good examples like, um, like South Africa, the, the, the song Jerusalem or whatever it is. You see, the, the DJ had to use some live artist. What's her name again? Uh, no, Who knows no this Chebo? one? Jerusalem? Yeah, Jerusalem. No, no, Chebo, Who's the artist? So you see, you need to use someone to give you an identity. And that's one thing that uh, seems to be lacking in Kenya, I'm sorry to say. Because if I take you back to the two powerhouses, which I believe is uh, right now is Nigeria and South Africa, in the 60s, uh, they had some traditional kind of music called Fuji or Juju music, depends which area of Nigeria you came from. And then came the marvelous uh, uh, Fela Kuti. In the 70s, it took the same Juju music, fused it with the funk, and came with the Afrobeat. You see? And then today, the Banner Boys, the Wizkid, uh, Davidos, all of those guys. They have taken what Fela uh, was doing and now they are calling Afrobeat with an S or Afropop. So you can see how it has progressed. And anytime you listen to Nigerian sound or South, South African sound, you will always see an identity. I think that currently, this, what's, what is the song? Chilling with the, with, with, with the big boys? <laughs> anyway, something like that. But you can see where it is coming from. So even whenever they're doing electro uh, electronic music, you can actually know it's, it's coming from South Africa. You see? And now, when we talk about Kenya, for example, I know we have got great sounds. Uh, this, uh, what do you call it? Uh, tone, Which is great. I love it. But when you ask them, where do you... Uh, uh, drive what, what, what your inspiration from? Unless they don't know. Because we kind of lost it. And it's not a blame game. I'm not time to blame your generation or my, but I think probably it's my generation. We passed, we are trying to pass on the baton, but it dropped. And you guys kept running. So even if you are ahead, you are actually practically disqualified. So we need to go back to the drawing board. Because, see, I am a judge um, um, of AFRIMA, All African Music Award. I go to Nigeria every year. And so I really have a great overview of what's happening in music in, in, this, in, in, the, in the continent. Because we go there, we're locked up in a room for one week, and we're listening music from Southern Africa, from Western Africa, from Central Africa, and from Eastern Africa. So, mostly, there, there are so many entries. Sometimes they even have as, as, as many as 4,000 entries. So imagine we're sitting there and we're listening to Nigerian music day in, day out, because they've are, they are got, got the, the majority of the entries. So maybe after two days, we say, ah, oh God, Nigeria is over tomorrow, we're going to East Africa. They said, yeah, we'll have fresh sound. 
So we come in the morning already. The first song, and because I'm the only one from, from Kenya, by the way, the first song said, oh, this is a song maybe from East Africa, Eastern Africa. So one of the jury will say, but no, that's sounding so Nigerian. And uh, so they asked me, Tabu, do you know, is that Kenyan music or is that uh, Ugandan music? And I said, yeah, it is. But you see, so what I'm trying to say, being good is one thing. But what should be really different, what, what sets you apart is being unique. So even as you are doing electronic music, please do some research. Know what was there before you. We are not short of genres of music. We have Momboko, we have Omtibo, we have Chakacha, we have Tarab. So you can all make this thing. We have Benga, of course. All these things can be made into electronic music. Because my argument has always been that don't really go trying to use electronic music as a genre. No. You can, but I, I, I would prefer you use electronic music to play existing genres. I think I'll leave it for now. Thank you, Tabu. That's, um, that's a lot. Um, a lot to think about. I think I really agree with you as somebody who's been researching Kenyan music for, for the last maybe four years, digging as a DJ for really interesting sounds to play, but sounds that you know stand out as Kenyan sounds or as East African sounds. I listen to the biggest, most successful uh, artists uh, in electronic music, and they sound like artists from America. They sound like artists from Europe, and I really agree. Like there, there's there's something that has happened where um, maybe aside from the gengeton, which you can trace back to genge, although you can't, it's a bit difficult to trace it that far back. And like you said, a lot of the artists don't really um, know wh where the roots of the music lie. Um, I agree. The, the, the artists have not been uh, kind of connecting their new musical lineages to the, uh, the ones that preceded them. And even in North America, you know, that, that's, where, that's where I'm usually based, um, hip-hop music really threaded the needle between soul, funk, and made those records uh, into a new form of music. And so even though the old people uh, used to, um, how can I say this? <laughs> they used to uh, denigrate their, the, the younger people's music, saying that it was noise. Um, there was still a form of, of respect there, whereby they sampled uh, previous music, and so older people could actually connect with the newer generation of music. So I agree with you. There's, there's some connecting to, to be done there. And um, I'm thinking... Um, this is very interesting because now we're talking about musical lineages, the roots of music, and the fact that traditional performers, you've all agreed, I think, and, and live performers, are what gives the identity, gives the uniqueness to um, somebody's productions, um, at least within a context where you're, you're, you're working towards music that is connected to those roots of that music. But maybe we can shift towards um, a conversation about, aside from employing a live musician or collaborating with a live musician, um, in the case that they're either recording a track or even sampling sounds, Kasiva, you, you were in studio with uh, Coco M, I believe, last year. Um, you laid down some drums for Emma's upcoming EP. <laughs> That's the plug. Um, you know what is it, wh what what is important for you to 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 have in that relationship with the producer? What um, what what is the baseline of of respect uh, that you need in that collaboration? How can you uh, how how do these producers make it work for you? Um, thanks. Uh, <coughs> wow, this one is uh, I think it's quite a sensitive question. But I think I'm just going to attack it heads on anyways. Um, I find that instrumentalists don't get the respect that they truly deserve by producers or by uh, fellow collaborators and especially um, 
I'll, I'll put it in in the layman's language the person that is on the computer does not give the person holding the instrument the respect they deserve and i don't know why this is so i'm still struggling to grapple that fact um but more so it's worse in this continent than world over like i've 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 done both and the kind of respect that you're given abroad as an instrumentalist and especially as a traditional instrumentalist is far much more than what you would get here it's almost as if here when you play a traditional instrument you're deemed as shady when in shamba and i i don't know why this is so because yani traditional instrumentalists are the wealth of the generation were the ones who hold the gold of this generation you know and and it's sad you know to hear that um it's sad to find that we can't find people like akina tabu um between my generation and his generation who can school us with that kind of knowledge it's it's such a worry and it's always because akina tabu are deemed washamba and i don't know why this is so um i feel like traditional instruments are the soul and i say soul because you if your name is john john is john is just a name but the true you lies in your soul your soul is something that you can't touch you can't see it's a spirit per se and the spirit of a song is carried by the live instrumentalists and i'll tell you why um each and every person has a soul and in everything that you do you input your soul that is if you're deep enough to connect with yourself and as a creative or a creator you put you input your soul into something that you do and that's not a joke in putting your soul is giving a part of yourself in something that you're doing so um thinking that um siwa lecture lakini people who think that instrumentalists um traditional instrumentalists na washamba au ndio washamba because they they don't get it they don't get it because the soul of that music is carried by that traditional instrumentalist because um you you you're fusing your soul with that person's soul and that i think tabu will talk about more like the the true meaning of you know traditional instruments and in what they were used for back in the day are for you know it, it wasn't just for entertainment there are instruments that were used for rituals there are instruments that were used for ceremonies um there's instruments that were played at certain places at certain times and they couldn't be played in certain places and certain times because of um some certain reasons and that i think that is very important to be honored in that sense in as much as culture is dynamic i think it's it's important overall to respect the source of you know the source of inspiration and the source of that instrument and what it means yeah. uh, yes Fully. carry on tabo i think you can you, <laughs> Yes, this is Washamba. Anyway, sorry just to jump into that. You know, no, I agree with the the Washamba uh, analogy you have given because um it came from a long time ago. When I was uh, in primary school uh in the 60s, where were you guys? Anyway, <laughs> when I was in primary school in the 60s, we had what they called a classroom disc. This classroom disc uh, I've been uh, made to understand is, is called the Welsh note. Means that if you spoke in your language, you are given that disc because you are only supposed to speak in English, communicate in English. So at the end of the the, cl- the class, those who had the disc will be punished. And during our days, the punishment was going to clean the the pit like twins so you know you are growing up thinking and forgive my language that your mother tongue your culture is shit because any time you speak it you are punished by cleaning the the the, the pit like twins so you, you can smell it 
not true. You, you, I mean, anytime somebody speaks, um, I mean, uh, their language is, oh my goodness, uh, am I going to be cleaning some toilets? So that's where that Mushamba thing came from. Because Shamba is the village. Unfortunately, when we go to independence, most of our fathers, your grandfathers or great grandfathers, we left our culture in the village and came here alone in town, the urban centers. Sorry to be talking about West Africa a lot and even uh, other countries. While places like Nigeria, you find that the same food they eat in the village is the same food they eat in the city. When I go to Nigeria, uh, they, are, they are always booked in a five-star hotel. And what do I get there? I get Nigerian food, pepe, soup, all that. While, while, while if you are in, in, uh, in one of those five-star hotels in, in Nairobi, forget it. Uh, try to ask uh, anything like Ugaili, they, they look at it and say, oh my goodness, where is this one from now? Uh, so, so anyway, about uh, traditional instruments being uh, like, uh, considered shamba, true, uh, Kasiba is right. Look how the West Africans have taken their kora. It's revered. Look at the jembe. It's revered. Awanyatiti, nothing. Until you Bogada tried and put it into the international uh, podium, and then a Japanese lady came here, took it, learned it from the masters in the village. She played it. She's playing it very well. And a lot of, of Kenyan girls are very angry about that. That why is she, she Japanese? But she learned it. She em embraced it. As we thought it was not cool. It's right now that you see a lot of girls uh, carrying a titi because they said, ah, oh, so our, our culture can be, uh, can be cool. Anyway, Going maybe to your question about, uh, I'm not a sound engineer, but I'm a music producer. Normally, when I'm working with somebody, like say a collaboration, for, I mean with an artist from the village, from the Shambani, whatever, I try, and I work very closely with Fisto too, we try to play around the, the, their music, not vice versa. We don't create beats and make that artist. Uh, fit into a bit because already you have changed it. So we are just um, talking with the Fisto when, as we are coming. You we are playing that great music by Maisy Myra, and um, you see her, her style of singing. It was, it's called what Tiedera or something like that. Her, her style of singing is very Western, which is beautiful, and the music is still Western. So one thing for you to succeed, bal balance the two. If your voice is very Western, use traditional instruments. If, if you are using too much traditional instruments, let your voice be Western. You need to balance that. And I keep on saying this, that um, the problem we have in, um, in Kenya, we have uh, musicians, I don't have name names, no, anyway, who play maybe a hangla and stuff like that. Name names, please. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Well, I mean, those guys who play like a hangla music. I say they are culturally literate but musically illiterate now you are generation you are musically literate but you are culturally illiterate if you cannot balance both then i don't see any future for you that's why you see someone kasiva she plays the drums and uh, traditional drums Yet she's also very much aware of contemporary music. So you guys, I'll just go back to go back to the drawing board, so that you use all the expertise you are getting from this class mm -hmm. to express your tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking of um, uh, you know what I said earlier about Kenyan music, uh, at least. In terms of modern and contemporary electronic productions, we have some s some few artists who make really um, unique and and uh, unique sounds that sound very East African. But like I said, a lot in the electronic scene specifically, it's a lot of uh, Western sounding sounds with like maybe sometimes a hint of you know some traditional instrumentation. And the reason why I, I give those producers a hard time is because they're not doing themselves any favors when they're doing that. They're not going to compete with Americans at their own game. They're not going to c compete with Europeans at their own game. 
and sometimes they look at um, Kenyan artists who are trying to do something unique, something traditional, and say that, you know, it's this or it's that, and they denigrate it. Those people ha have a more unique sound, and it's actually going to stand out in the international market. You can't uh, beat other people at their own game in that sense. And it's okay to make music that is inspired by other Western music and stuff, but um, it's also good and important to be connected with uh, with who you are. Please, yeah. please, Fiston. And you as well, if you have any questions. I'm very proud that recently, uh, me and Tabu, we had a project which we decided to use only traditional instrument and some disadvantages uh, singer so we, we have done it and then it sounds very good and then we use even animal when I took it to London everybody they love it they really love it so my advice if you want to to be unique you have got a lot of traditional instrument play around with it just a quick one you know sometimes about instruments it's not what you play but how you play it a quick uh, uh, you guys are young so i don't know i don't know if you remember someone like franco or, or oliver mutukuzi okay oliver mutukuzi actually played the guitar but in his mind he was playing the mbira so he made the guitar sound like the mbira and i remember there are so many uh, times uh, there's a time i was in the um, I think I was in Paris, something like that. And, and uh, Yusun Duru was performing. And normally, he has a very big band, you know. But that day, because maybe of travel, he had just like about five-piece band. And then I could hear this chorus, beautiful. And I was trying to, where is this guy sitting? I couldn't see the chorus guy, but I could hear every, everything on the notes. I, it was the guitar player who had just tuned this guitar to sound like the chorus. So it's sometimes not what you play, but how you play it. So it monopolizes. I think true, somebody was true, going true. to talk. No, that's um, great and very interesting. Um, so I like this because we started out very broad, uh, talking about the role of musicians within electronic music, and now we're getting a little bit more into the details and, and the more granular um, information. I want to go back to the question I asked you, Kasiva. You said there's not enough respect but, you know, from the person who's behind the computer vis-a-vis -vis the person who's playing the instrument. Let's get specific about what happens in a recording session, or even before or after the recording session? What is important to you? And even you, Fiston, I, I would like to hear you on this. What is important um, to have? What, what is that respect? How does it manifest? How do you know you're being respected? How do you know you're, you're not being respected? Thanks. Um, so for me, I think... Hold on a second. Would, could you try to reconnect the mic? There we go. All right. So I think the most important for me is letting the instrumentalist or the musician in session aware, making them aware of what is happening. I say aware in the sense of most of the traditional instrumentalists fortunately or unfortunately have not gone to school and so they don't understand the these um, rules and expectations and laws in terms of copyright and i think it's our responsibility to let them know what happens Usually, and this is very sad, most producers take advantage of the fact that Aumse Agenda Chuoso, um, they'll quote-unquote use them for their own benefit. Don't forget that these are creatives just like you and they're giving you a lot of soul. So I think for me that's the most important. For you to let them know that where the music is going to be used, um, what is theirs? I mean, just give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Um, secondly, just, you know, basic etiquette of handling musicians in studio and, and just how you communicate. I think, first of all, it just stems from a point of actually realizing that this is a creative 
and both of you if if you if you deem yourself as a creative a hundred percent even the orutu player is a creative a hundred percent they're not any lesser than you at just because they play a traditional instrument um so i think first it just starts from there because once you realize that and get it into your system and learn to respect people in that way then i think the rest just flows very naturally you feel obliged to let them know what's going on you feel obliged to teach them um you feel obliged to pay them respectfully and um um pay them pay them their dues on time pay them what they deserve and if they and and this i find this this is like i think this is now like god sent now if you feel like if you ask them how much they charge and they tell you 2k and you know fitsana you have 30000 for that budget please don't pay them 2k educate them and let them know yo in this electronic space ku sample in a costing this much because if you don't teach them then who will teach them and who will um who is going to create the worth of traditional instruments it starts from you and i so if you know that um say you've you've i don't know you have a grant or you know this is going to be used in uh, wakanda the wakanda the movie can you hear me uh, yeah um yeah so for example if you know that um this track that you're making is going to be used in uh the black panther 3 you guys don't play don't pay the oru to player 2000 you know what you're doing and it's going to come back to you remember these instruments have spirits anyways no it's 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 really important to treat them the way they're supposed to be treated and for me that's really 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 cool and really important i hear that um i think computers like uh, T tabu mentioned and kasiva mentioned they seem to be bringing a lot of problems they're at the center of our the, the musical the wide musical genre that we call electronic music um and they made things a lot easier and more accessible right how much would it have cost uh back in the 70s to get a whole band together and do a song how much does it cost now for you to make a song in your bedroom you have one machine it does almost everything you need maybe a pair of headphones maybe a sound card if you're really serious that's convenient but it brings in a bunch of new problems right where somebody is not used to working with musicians and not used to rolling with a big crew of people and thinking about making sure everybody knows what's going on in the session they're used to dealing with their own thing and then when they bring somebody else in like give me my sound okay now cool we're good right so i think um the computer even the way it was designed as a indiv a laptop it's a it's a it's a one person thing right whereas computers if you wanted if the the engineers would have designed it for a community you could have had uh, these could have been family appliances right where the whole family uses it but it wasn't designed like that it's one person one computer and so it puts you into this individualistic mindset from the get go it's not meant for you to be sharing or considering um other people within your work um I'm thinking now, maybe Fisna, did you want to add something um, to, to what Kasiva had just said in terms of what is important in terms of respect when you're in a session? And I hope everybody's taking notes, huh? Because you're going to be recording in the next couple of weeks uh, with some musicians. It depends where, where you are doing your music, you know. In England, it's okay. They respect, they pay you good. Every time you pay, you play, or you record. It depends also if you you are going to play, and then is you are going to create a partition to match the music they are showing you is another thing. If the person, that person who called you, is give, giving you the part him he wants you to play is another thing. So I can say. In UK, it's okay. Mm. And here, like like uh, Kasiva also said, there's there just seems to be a bit less respect over here. But I don't know if that, uh, and I'm not a performer, so you know, take my opinion with a grain of salt. I think 
if Kasiva or Fiston go to the UK to play, they're working on it maybe a, a bit of a higher level than if, uh, you know, somebody was to go and uh, make music with a bedroom producer. We call them bedroom producers yeah. because they don't even have their own studio or office, right? They produce in their rooms. There's a different baggage that comes with that. Maybe when you go to London, uh, when you're in London, Fiston, there's split sheets with the artists. There's contracts and agreements. I think, can I see a show of hands of the people who are here? How many people have made a split sheet with artists before for a session that they've done? I see almost half, almost half, uh, may, uh, maybe a bit more. So that's pretty good. These are our advanced students. So <laughs> um, are there any contractual elements or, you know, uh, um, maybe more, yeah, l l legal um, things that are important to you in terms of, you know, like you said, Kasiva, making the musician aware of what's happening, letting them know this is going to be used once for this song, it's going to be broadcast here, or we're creating a, s a, a sound bank with your sounds and the contract we're signing is for multiple uses. What if the sound bank gets sold? What if it's being given out for free? Um, I'm assuming it's a v it's preferable to, to have you know um, clear agreements on that ahead of time, right? Um, and I don't know I, I don't know what advice you could give to these um, producers as to how they could go about that and what's fair. I think just before even I chime in, like what I think should be done, I I just want to add on to um, what Fiston says. Um, so, like abroad, when I th I think the reason why abroad you're given that respect and that kind of treatment and that kind of it's almost as if they realize that this is very serious and this is very important is because it stems i think it boils down it's almost like a ripple effect of understanding the importance of culture and the importance of uh, uh you know the roots to in in respect to music um because it's 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 funny that we have all these things here um but I think it's also just human behavior that when you have something, you don't really see and appreciate it as much as somebody who doesn't have. Um, they say when you have a good girlfriend and a good wife, uta mistreat and go cheat um, with somebody who d cannot completely ever match the level of your girlfriend just because. And then okiacho is when you realize oh, oh my goodness i had a jewel i had i had i was in possession of gold we have all these instruments here we 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 alhamdulillah we 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 are african we live here we have these instruments at our disposal but then when you go there and they don't have these instruments at their disposal you are you're a diamond and Diamonds are are they're, they're treated with respect. They're very expensive. You have to take care of a diamond, and that's what happens. I think it's time we really um, started understanding that our culture is our wealth, and you don't you don't take your wealth and throw it in the trash. You don't you polish if you have a diamond. You polish it. You keep it in a special place. You wear it to special places, and you're very proud of it. And I think we should treat our culture in the same same way. We need to be very proud. We need to polish our culture. We need to um, own it and and show it off because it is ours. It is what we've been freely given by God. And for that, then then after we realize that that realization is going to it's it's almost again a ripple effect. It's going to um, infuse in the spaces of music where producers and traditional instrumentalists can work with each other uh vizuri you can um will we, now you can bring in the aspect of ethical sampling um where people like totally understand what is yours and what is mine what rights that i have in this music versus what i don't have um there's also um you know, you know, there's you you can come to a mutual understanding about the use of these instruments, but then again, it is your wealth. 
you're allowed to use it so you you won't use it badly you lose it nicely because again just like a diamond you won't wear your diamond to lutu lutuli mm. yeah C- can i just add something oh i, j- I just want to, uh, to to let kasiva completely finish that thought because we're trying to get specific for the producers right yeah. is it worth it for them to sit down with the traditional musician or the performer beforehand and before even getting into studio and having a discussion about what the sound is going to be used for what it is that they're recording as a separate thing or is that a conversation that you can have on the fly in the studio i think i think um i think this goes from person to person because there's there's people who have you know better communication skills and you can just vibe in studio but what i what i insist on is being proactive in providing information to the traditional instrumentalist because you in front of the computer probably if if you know how to operate a computer and if you know how to operate ableton and work ableton it means then somehow somehow you understand copyright and there's more that you understand uh, probably that musician maybe doesn't know right. i feel like you need to be proactive in providing that information first and if you don't know then you should find out before getting into exactly into that recording session exactly so that you can provide that information for the musician because otherwise you're putting yourself in a dangerous situation exactly you might be putting them inside a situation where they're not being yeah. treated appropriately there's, there's also there's also a situation where you might not know and you're working with a traditional musician fine sour for example say you guys get in studio and um, record a traditional musician and then 15 years down the line your track um, is taken by bbc as the soundtrack for a particular program that's a lot of tunes you should have the etiquette to remember ultengeneza is song no lemse wa orutu and go back and let them know that this song is doing this way this is what is yours again it's just it's it's just basic courtesy but what we see around is and 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 i've suffered this much so it almost puts me in a space where i'm very aware um working and especially with especially with sampling and especially with recording is um you don't get first of all you're not honored for what you do in the sense of if this uh music travels and bears um get some chums down the line you you will never know um you didn't go there as a session musician it was um a mutual agreement of um this and this happens um you've signed maybe uh to get this and this but the people try keep hiding it as if um the song has gotten chums it's gotten chums just give the traditional instrumentalist their chums uh the the other thing is sometimes you go record and see you ref- uh, s- let's say i've 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 come to record with you and then and then um coco accesses your computer and probably she's making making music on your computer and she finds my percussion files and she also takes the same recordings and infuses them in her song that's stealing that's outright stealing and i don't support that at all it's happened once it's happened twice it's happened to my friend actually um and i i think it's just that's just really wrong it's where you really cross the line in the sense of you need to me a wealthy i'm to vibe remember we're not trying to you as a person you're not trying to make one big diamond we're trying to enable everybody to be able to access and afford their own diamonds yeah tabu did you want to add something no i think kasiva has really said it what, what i was trying to just to say that um, ip or intellectual property is a very new phenomenon in this um, in africa because mostly people always thought that music was for free to play thing a good example i think it was in the 1990s um, we were having um, a show in london and then uh, i saw some friends from kenya so i told them, oh guys we are here come in get in get in get in i'm the one in charge here they said no 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 we'll pay if we don't pay <laughs> who's going to pay but right here when you try to charge for i mean for concerts people don't want to pay 
So uh, in the UK, I think, uh, no, in the Western world, they appreciate arts more than we do. So we need more classes to teach people. You talked about the split sheet and things like that. Because one thing, IP, just, uh, it's your property, just like my, 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 my tab here. So I can sell it to you if I want to. You see what I mean, so it depends how you agree with the individuals. And then another uh, thing that is also very tricky uh, or, uh, is um, they are communal songs. So also you have to be very careful who owns the copyrights. But that's, I think, a topic for another day. I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, I wanted to say something. I think uh, it's very important to say that. You may feel strange. Sometimes it's not only good to go because of money. You have also to, to see opportunity. I can give you an example. The band I'm playing now, Africa, is the band that who pay me. Yeah. So that band started, one person called me, said Fiston, we want uh, a Congolese guitarist to come to play in our record. But we don't have anything to pay you, but we give you transport. Accept it. I went. The music they put there for me to play was not Congolese music. So I have to make my mind how I can match that music. Then I play and it was good. So after finishing, instead of giving me the money, they, t they put me in the car back home. After three months, they called me and said, that music sound very good we want now to make a band so we started the band then now it became a big band so i'm getting money from that so you have also to 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 see uh, because sometimes when you are too hard you miss chances as artist you are two things you need you need to say brand. You need to show people to know you. So that is my advice. I have a question now for people in the audience because I just want you guys to maybe participate a bit. Um, one of the questions that we thought about for this topic, including sampling and traditional instruments, um, you've seen you know, music now inspired by African music, uh, East African music even is being made not just here, but in London, in France, even in my city of Montreal. So the question we had here was, does electronic music have a problem with cultural appropriation? Does anybody want to answer that one? Hi, everyone. Uh, I think there definitely is a problem, but like, there's also a new uh, definition of like what society is and like what a culture is, like and who the culture is re like uh, restricted to. I think that's what you're referring to when you're saying culture is dynamic. But like now, uh, there is someone in Portugal who grew up listening to Ethiopian jazz and feels super identified with it. And I don't know whether it's I don't know whether it's, or at least it's not my right to take that away from them, like, because they're genuinely represented by the music, like, that's what they grew around, and that's what they listen to, so, unless they're trying to do it as a gimmick, I don't really think, there is ethical implications, though, yeah. but, like, there is also this other side to consider, where it's like, I am genuinely represented by this music, this is my culture, too, because this is all I listen to, but, yeah, that's basically it. I guess there's no hard and fast rules, right? And just to, you know, give that full flip side completely, like Lucorito said, like the world is globalized now, you know? There's, uh, there's Kenyans and Congolese people in my city in Canada, and there's Americans and uh, people from the UK here getting involved with culture, so the lines uh, become blurred. But let's think about cultural appropriation uh, in the context where some musicians out here are struggling to make a living and other people are making money with their music overseas. 
uh, whether it's DJing it or producing it. Yeah. Please introduce yourself uh, and uh, give your pronouns before you speak. Uh, hi guys, uh, my name is Freddy Muya. He, him. Um, I'd like to add on what Justin has said and what Lucorito has said, and also what she said. Kind of like merge all of them together and give my thoughts on it. So, um, there there is the aspect of when you can you can grow up on an, in another part of the world with a different culture, but still get interested in another culture. And I think it's, it's a personal opinion, but might be kind of like the way to like look at these things is as long as someone respects the culture, has done their due research on it, understand it, understands it deeply, and does not like do a parody of it. Like, this is a good example. I was looking for like traditional instruments online uh, just to see if there are any like contact or like things like that for contract instruments for like African music and stuff. And I found like there were a lot by native instruments. Like you can get a pack from the Middle East. You don't even understand that culture. You don't, and it's sold like if you are like to pay a musician, like a mid musician from the Middle East or West Africa. I didn't find any East African ones. That's a might be a good thing. But the West African one was like all their traditional instruments played at different velocities. Like you don't even need to contact a person from West Africa to tell you like what the drums mean. Like different drums mean different things. They might be played at different occasions. Then you might take those drums from native instruments and then you put them in your song and maybe like the context of it, you're almost like doing a parody of the music instead of because when you get resources like that, the way she said, like, if you take drums from a traditional instrumentalist who did not, like, give them to you, you did not have an understanding, a connection, where you, s where you talked about, like, what their sounds mean or, like, the context of them, I think that's the problem. Not necessarily, like, electronic musicians using, like, cultures from other places. It's more of the, like do they understand what it means and like the value yeah it, that's my that's my two cents on the thing like as long as somebody understands it respects it and has done the the like a few days ago i went to my f my neighbors are maasai like traditional maasai so like one day i went to them and like asked them if i could sample one of their they were doing like a ceremony and i was like passing by said hi and then i was like oh i could sample this but then when i talked to them they were like oh the, you can't we can't allow you maybe another time when we are doing another ceremony we can now call you and you can do your recording but for this ceremony it will kind of be rude for you to take because it was like a sorrowful thing and i did not know because I, I i first asked so that i could see if i it's just polite but then now getting the context that oh if i had recorded without their permission it would have been offensive yeah that's my two cents on it as long as you understand it and you talk to the people they give you the permission to use it that's also another thing you can ask for especially the really really traditional things because there's a lot of context there might be ceremonial like things that yeah things like that let me just chime in on what you've said, man. Thank you, Freddie. You, you, you've, you've spoken like, a, like an old wise man. <laughs> um, I'm starting to realize that maybe even before this workshop, David, maybe we could have even started with an African identity workshop because it circles an, around cultural identity. Um, I remember... Um, I was on tour some time back and there's a topic that we used to do in every stop that we used to, uh, in every university that we used to stop at because the tour was centered around universities and it was about African identity. What is African? Who is African? And I think once you sort of solve this within yourself, then you're able to understand I think you're able to understand cultural appropriation more. 
it's true that um, the world is fast changing, very fast changing, and especially with, with technology, it's almost as if we can't keep up. And now we have access to multiple cultures that we never had. I'm also struggling to understand that. It's, it's just me thinking out loud. I'm also struggling to understand um, how to keep a culture alive in representation to something like sampling. Because Tabu said that it's not how... It's not you playing an instrument. It's how you play the instrument. And for me, in as much as, say, you might have a sample of, say, Nyatiti in a pack, how you use it in the music is what determines whether you're representing that culture. Because you can hear the timbre of the, you can hear the sound and the timbre of the instrument, but does it sound Kenyan or does it have to sound Kenyan? You know, it's a lot of questions to ask um, because you can having, so you stemming out of that culture, for instance, like the pack from the Middle East that you mentioned, if you used it in your own way of creativity, it's, it's, it's not wrong or right. It's you flexing your creativity and doing what your, you know, where your soul leads you. But will somebody from the Middle East really understand? Do they have to understand? That's, that's another question, I think. Hi, everyone. I'm Nabalayo uh, Shiha. I'm a um, singer, folk musician, masquerading as a producer. So I'm looking at it from a different angle. And um, on the topic of what we're discussing, I feel like if your music is going to be very culturally um, centered, then to avoid appropriation, you have to fly the flag of whoever you're taking, whatever you're taking from. And I feel like it's also important to remember a lot of these folk practices have this aspect of community which in to date presents itself in a different way. But I feel like it's important to um, plug in and see how music was made in the past. Um, so we have to consolidate the ideas of intellectual property now, but also how music belonged to the community in the past. And also what has been said understanding the context of the music and being respectful of the um, practices around it the people and their ideologies and all those things yeah that's what i have to say Aish, thank you so much that's so relevant and so true um and i think that idea of preserving culture and flying the flag of the community uh, whose instruments, whose sounds, whose inspirations you're using is s very key. As you can see down there, we have a book that Tabu brought. Um, Ketable publishes a lot of content that allows you to do a bit of that research. They've done a bit of the hard digging for you. And uh, for a very affordable price, you can <laughs> get yourself a copy of the books. And they have, I think they ha you have DVDs as well, right? Yeah, but not on this book. This not, book. Yeah. Retracing uh, popular music, retracing the Benga rhythm, uh, songs of protest, and Kenya's funk. You know, some of you don't know that we really used to have like the Motown kind of sound. We had great guys like Slim Ali, you know, they were really great, uh, you know, the, the Magic Cavaliers. So they were, really, they were really funky, but those days are gone. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Sam, he, him. Uh, yes, so I wanted to address the point where Kasiva was, or I think it was you who asked the question about why people abroad making money and people here making the same music which they've grown up with. They're not. So I think it relates to what he said, especially when he was talking about um, the balance between musical music music literacy and cultural literacy right now we're in a world where anyone can listen to your song at any place any time and 
as long as it's pop, it pops and it's something new, it's not related in terms of understanding the context, but how it sounds. So like if it would sound nice, like a good example is drill music. You know, we actually don't understand the context of drill music, but it pops, that kick, that 808, man, you know. And it, transcend, it transcended from, I think it was UK, to go to Pop Smoke, picking it up and doing the thing, to come into Kenya with Brooklyn boys, Buru, Brooklyn, mm -hmm. you know, yep. and going all over. But again, um, which is why it's important for me personally, um, in this program, just to understand the context of even what I'm making, so that I don't find myself using a nice nyatiti in a club theme song drop, and maybe it was dedicated to someone, you know, so, so that I don't use it in a way that's not allowed, and I'm fined for <laughs> center something. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think that's that's, that's what I wanted to say. Just can I just add something on that? Please, yeah. <clears throat> some years ago, there were, um, I can't even remember, there were some French DJs who came to Kenya. Name them. <laughs> no, I can't remember their name. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, they had sampled uh, some music. It was a new song. It was a dodge for the, the politician Tom Boyer who was killed some many years ago. So the song was about Dajit, how the morning, how their son had been shot. So this guy, he did not understand what the song was all about. So he, he, he was playing it like, like in a happy mode. And he was playing it at Lyons. I told him, hey, by the way, do you know exactly what this song is about? And he did not know. So just what he said, it's good to do some due diligence and know exactly what you are getting into. It can be very rewarding, too, to do that research and to, um, you know, get, get to know... Uh, the culture from which you're borrowing, there's multiple tribes in Kenya. So, you know, it's, it's not, it, you, you can almost keep researching forever and just keep um, enriching yourself with that knowledge. Um, I think, yeah, Freddie Nabalayo. Yes, coming. Freddie Nabalayo um, and also Sam, like great points all around. Those are really good bases for, you know, thinking about how you're going to collaborate with musicians. Take the time to get to know them, ask them for permission, be transparent. Then there's a lot of like legal things that we can go into, but that should be the starting point, right? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Rabudi, Rabudi Bang. Um, I'm a dude. Um, I had a question, yeah? And um, it's for the both of you. But uh, it's also for Tabu as well. So I've noticed that you're quite aware of the concept of electronic music, the DJs and the producers and how it works together. So my question first is, how did you come to know of all of this? Being an old timer, how did all this come to your attention? If you could ans ask that, answer that for me first. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the answers yes, I've been uh, around all along. I mean, uh, I was born in 1954, and today we're 2022. So I was there, which was starting. Like you see, what sometimes um, um, the, Z the the Z generation. You think that uh, us being old, we don't know what's happening. Computers, if I'm going to go to Peter, I said, oh, this old man with a computer. I mean, who invented these things? They're very old. Hip hop, for example. Who, who invented hip hop? They're in their 80s, almost. So my answer, I've, I've been, I mean, I've been to music. That's what I've been doing all my life. So they come, they go. Okay, makes sense. Um, so my next question is collectively for the three of you. Um, Nairobi music, and when I say Nairobi music, I mean it because Kenya is wide, but a lot of us here have grown up in Nairobi. And Nairobi personally for me is, I have some affection for the city because we do travel to go to our grandparents, 
But, you know, my grandparents don't have electricity. So when I go there, my phone is dead throughout. So I can't even, I don't know, I can't connect. When I'm there, I'm there. When I'm here, I'm here. So even if I was to speak about my cultural background, I really can't um, take a picture when I'm at home and say, this is my grandma, this is where she goes to church. You know, there's like, it's like once you're in, you've traveled, you've traveled. And then you come back, you've come back. So it's like two different worlds. So being in Nairobi my whole life, there's a lot of Nairobi influences. Like earlier early on, a crusade passed here and everybody had it. And it was like really loud and, you know, really Kenyan. You could say so because it's like, religious you know it's you can hear the banger you can hear the the over the top vocal you know and it's it's like those influences all around us have created a genre of its own Nairobi music because you know even just growing up hip-hop from the states and house from the UK or from Chicago, all of that from South Africa, Kwaito, Nigerian Afropop, Kenya or Nairobi, we are very big consumers. And somehow this has just like created something in itself. We really can't put a finger on it, to be honest. But every time I hear people telling me, as Kenyans, we don't have a sound, I agree. But as Nairobians of this generation, we kind of do have an idea somewhere. I, we just haven't sort of like put a name to it or like a sound to it or whatever, but I'd like to give a, a shout out to someone in the crowd from uh, a group called Expresso. Every time I hear the music, I'm like, yeah, man, this is, this is Nairobi music. I can't even say it's Kenyan music. I can't even say it's African music. It's just, it's Expresso music, right? But it's also Nairobi, because Nairobi had this time when I was coming up after high school, where there was this thing called the New Nairobi Movement. New Nairobi had this identity to it. So the identity we sp spoken of in the beginning of the talk, yeah? An identity has formed over time. How we dress, you know? I could wear fans, but I could wear dashiki. And I could wear like a neck piece, and that is an identity, but it's come from all over the place. You know, my vans are skater shoes from New York, my jeans are je Levi jeans from London, but my dashiki is from somewhere in Nairobi, Maasai Market. So, this collection of parts of ourselves that have created an identity have also created a sound and a culture. And um, is there a question in there? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. So the, the question was this new identity that we have created for ourselves as Nairobians and our lesser generation, does it have that same significance of an identity or do we still need to do a little bit more digging? Is that for me or for who to ask? <laughs> <laughs> you see, I mean, Come, what I, I can say about that, you are quite right. Uh, when we are talking about Kenyan sound not being there and this Nairobi sound, I'm not very sure if you are so right because um, within Nairobi itself, there's the urban poor. I'm sure the sound in Kibera is very different from the sound in uh, upper uh, market areas. So you see, the, it, it's, it's very dicey, you know, about uh, having a proper Nairobi sound. Because I think it, it helps to have uh, an identity. I mean, it's more urban. But I'm sure that uh, people from the urban poor and rural areas have their own sound. I keep on saying that most expatriates do come to, to Kenya and I've, I know many of them are my friends, they take like five years and they have never, they don't know what Kenyan sound is. 
or even Nairobi Sound, for example. There was a gentleman, um, he, he, he was, uh, he was, uh, he was, uh, he was uh, doing his PhD, so he came here and visited so many places. He was writing about his uh, thesis on in music, Kenyan music. Then um, they, they, they always told me, oh, maybe you also should talk to Tabu. And uh, then I met him just before he left back to the, the, to the US. So I said, oh, Tabu, I, I, I'm sorry, we, our, our paths have not crossed, but I've heard about you. So I talked to him about what I know about Kenyan music and the sounds. And I decided to take him to a place called uh, The Garage in Kibera. And that day they were playing their strong hangla beat. Do you know the guy just told what he had written, said, I don't know Kenyan music, let me start afresh. So as much as you say that uh, Nairobi has got its own uh, sound, no. In fact, um, you see like uh, places like Nigeria again, I'll talk about like Pigeon, which really gives them a, a lot of identity. But the problem with your generation, Sheng, I love Sheng, but the problem with Sheng is a language of, of uh, hiding. Because today they have a word, Tomorrow, when guys like us know that word, they, they switch off, they, 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 they get you to some other <laughs> word. So it's, it's, it's never consistent. So how can it really like develop? How, how can we like have a, a proper sound for it? Because Sheng is really great. If you guys had, could just write maybe Sheng and say, let's be consistent. Uh, maybe something yeah. like, I don't know, Buddha, I don't know what. When, when really? I said those things, I said, oh gosh, that's so old. So you see, in Pigeon is spoken in Nigeria, in Ghana, yeah. in most of those Western countries, and doesn't change much. So you see, it is giving, 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 it gives an identity because part is the rhythm, like you guys are uh, doing uh, the electronic music, it's, uh, the rhythm, the melodies, or whatever. But you need also someone to sing, and that's when you, when you hear somebody sing from South Africa, yes, you know this is Southern Africa or it's Pigeon. So yeah. we need to work on that. Yes, I believe Sheng is, uh, is, is, uh, is a Nairobi, Nairobi an identity. But you guys need to work on it. Hey, we, we will defend Sheng to the death over here because uh, <laughs> we're Sheng lovers. But I feel you on that um, taboo. Sheng is a language of hiding. I like that so much. And I think if we think about it, really, New Nairobi was like a musical genre of hiding because it was not consistent either. Yes. It's very cool. Definitely a wave. And we all definitely followed it. I personally, you know, I love, uh, I, I love that whole wave of new Nairobi music that came out. But was it a genre? I don't know. To me, maybe it was more of a scene, you know, because um, the sound kept on evolving over time. And like Tabu said, um, that was like an uptown thing. It was an upper class sound. Like people in Kibera are not listening to, uh, you know, new Nairobi jams like that uh, and that's not to say that it makes the music less good it's just is it like culturally relevant to like a, a significant uh, broad community or is it a very niche thing there's nothing wrong with that but then the you know how does that fit in with identity um but thank you for your your comment rabudi like that was that was really i think got everybody thinking myself specifically yeah, sure. um let me just chime in on that. Thanks, Rabudi, for your comment and big up on all the work that you're doing in the industry. I hear you. Um, I believe Kenya is a very, very, very times three special place to be in. It's, it's very different. And I say this because I've been born and raised here, but I've been traveling quite a lot. And even how other people speak of us is, it's just very different. First, because of the, um, you know, we, the, the kind of ideas that emanate from Kenya are very great ideas. If like you sit on, and, and Tabu can tell you this for free, if, if you sit on a panel of judging ideas and you see the kind of ideas that come out of this country, they're absolutely amazing. It's, it's almost unbelievable at what speed we're thinking about things and how we see things. Um, I think Kenya is one of the countries that doesn't have a sound for sure. And I remember I was placed in a forum and guys were like, um, we were playing a little game and we were like, 
name a country and somebody in less than three seconds names an artist that they know that is related to that kind of genre and then they say um so like sort of like the star or the flag bearer of the music of that country so we say congo and somebody shouts a name and senegal and somebody shouted a name and kenya was mentioned and no name emanated from this country why because we don't have a you like sort of a, like a unified sound that represents the country when you say that nairobi has a culture it's true nairobi has a deep culture but i also feel like we are super subdivided and the divisions go deeper and deeper and deeper and even what you know about nairobi is probably not the representation of nairobi maybe what you know of nairobi is where do you live if i may ask langata say okay so you live in langata maybe the culture that you identify with is langata culture mobile sides if you go to otiende guys are listening to ohangla there yeah. and guys don't wear vans there guys you you'll find a guy wearing a t-shirt and a kala that's that's imagine and it's just it's it's this is a constituency and even inside the constituency things are still subdivided just within langata see uh, is is kibra part of langata yeah. i think so yeah but, but as you said it's quite subdivided it's very subdivided yeah, yeah, yeah. literally um it's funny i grew up in i i grew up in langata and there's like i just langata and kibera are neighbors like this i used to go to church in kibera and come back home to langata and the culture in kibera is completely different completely different the kind of music they listen to there what they eat um how they choose to dress and even like within kibera you'll still find line saba and olympic culture is still very different however in other countries i don't know why this doesn't happen and i think it's because of first we embrace um kenyans have embraced technology very fast and that's why it's kenya is the hub of east africa that's why um all the experts are choosing to come here that's why um if you see you know global organizations setting their base here um if you see uh the un setting it's you know hq here you know then you 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 actually know that this this is a hub and i think for the fact that we embrace culture so quickly uh, not culture but technology so quickly it really contributes to why we're super like i would say quote in quote disintegrated in terms of cultural identity i think it's something to really really think about because I don't know if in essay it's like that I'm actually set out to like study one other country in Africa like deeply to understand why we are so disintegrated in terms of cultural identity and I completely understand um can you imagine the generation that's going to come after you guys like they won't even know what a chondo is they won't know what a kala is and and it's accepted it's culture it's dynamic it's just that in this country it's moving at a at a pace that i don't even understand also we don't get to stick with our cultural traits as much as other places for example no sooner than gengeton came than it left i don't like i i up to this day there's still some words za gengeton that came and left zenye sik why elewa you know and i wonder why does this happen also how can I, i you know when gengeton came in i was like ah i feel like finally we are starting to get a sound but i don't know it was it was it was the fast food of of music and uh, now you're opening a whole can of worms oh! <laughs> <laughs> gengeton is it is it finished is it it was it was has the wave it, passed it, it it's it's mm. passing and it's unfortunate it's so, passing <laughs> i just want to give uh one of our students a chance to to speak um on what we were saying a bit earlier yeah so this thought came to me when uh, rabudi was speaking and i wrote them down so that i do not forget so um to do with our nairobi culture uh first of all personally i'm coming from a biased side because i studied 
a music degree in KU, exposed to a lot of traditional folk music and ideologies. So I'm now always coming in from the other side. And um, as a person who understands how much we've lost, or even like just can try to imagine, because I'm sure I can't understand how much has been lost, I'm always on the side of what are we doing now that we know we have lost so much. And that's the driving force for my music practice at the moment. And I did see the new Nairobi documentary. It left a sour taste in my mouth. <laughs> I was angry to the point of tears. I did cry. And um, I was thinking about the Nairobi culture, and I feel like we have, in terms of Nairobi culture for us young people, we have our own modified versions of other people's things. We are doing what other people are doing, but in our own way and calling it our culture, which it doesn't give, it doesn't make it a practice. You know, when I talk about my music, I don't say what I do. I talk about my music practice. It has its own, um, like, characteristics. It has its roots from where it draws from. If you're interested, I have a website, nabalaya.com. <laughs> so, um, I mean, like, this Nairobi, it's more of a feeling. It's more of a vibe. I don't think it's a cultural practice per se. And even if it is, it's a passing one. I feel like usually it doesn't have roots. It's really hard to elaborate and go in and say, this is the Nairobi culture. You know, it's, it's more of explaining the vibe around it. Um, most of the sounds that come up, you can really equate them to existing things. And... Um, yeah, the way it's set up, you can't see the roots, longevity. So I, I would I would disagree with the Nairobi sound. I, I still feel like it doesn't exist, but I'm hopeful. One thing I really love is when people uh, criticize things, but they're actively doing something about the problem. So people check out Nabalayo's album. It's amazing. Changanya. Um, we have now reached the uh, near end of our panel. So I want to let everybody um, say, say maybe a last few, few words. Um, and then everyone's welcome to continue the discussions. I know we just hit some really hot topics at the end there. I'm sure everyone's going to want to debate. You're welcome to do so. Can I get um, maybe like a closing statement from all of you? Really appreciate all of you for, for, for doing this, for being present with us. Uh, we learned a lot. Please, a little round of applause for our panelists and for yourselves. Thanks, thanks to those who participated with some questions. Kasiva, please, some closing remarks. Thanks so much for having us. Um, it's, it was really nice talking to you guys, but also just hearing what you guys have to say um, has left me with a lot of questions. I, I'm a deep believer of cultural dynamism um, and really just search deeper to what 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 your soul uh, vibrates to and what you believe in deeply I, I and that that is like in caps deeply believe in and um, what you bounce to um, because it truly really affects what you term and define as culture um, I will keep um, identifying with the culture that I was born in because it's shaped who I am, my beliefs, um, and what turns out of my brain is, is primarily what I grew up in. But I also, um, as, as time goes, I feel like um, cultures from elsewhere are influencing the kind of person that I'm growing up into. And I'm not stagnant to saying, I am a Kenyan, I like Ugali, full stop. Uh -uh. Um, I'm allowing myself to exist in these cultures and also allow these cultures to influence my creativity. Watch out for my music in March. It's dropping hot. Thanks so much. And that music, when you listen to that music, you will understand what I mean by cultural dynamism. You will hear Kenya, 
but you'll also hear other places represented on an equal everyone has a 50 50 share in that music and it truly reflects my journey as a percussionist um, not only being born here but what other places that i've been to have brought to me and who i'm becoming santini sanaman I can just add this. You are lucky that you are hearing all of this. Because me, I grew in Congo. We didn't have a chance to have this kind of thing. So my advice is sometimes I avoid to, to give music a name because if you, for example, you are trying to, to make a song, you think reggae, that your song become reggae. Because you think reggae. But if you don't think, you just make music as it comes to your mind, you can create a style. Because those names you are hearing, uh, reggae, this, it didn't come from the tree. Someone started. So you need also to know the difference between modern music and electronic music. With the mus modern music, is based on melody, melody, and dance. But with electronic. You have to go deep because there are so many. It's more than that. You need to, to know how to combine sound, like forest sound, uh, river sound, animal, and all, all emotional sound, how to mix them. And so I'm just advised because I see you sitting here, that means you need to learn something. So think about that. You create. I'm very happy to hear uh, the boy there trying to to fight about uh, Nairobi, sound. Nair Nairobi sound. It's a good point. So fight more, you get it. Uh, thank you. Mine is just to tell you that uh, please reconnect to your roots. That's what has led to the successes of musicians. In fact, when Kasiba was saying that maybe there's no proper name that you can mention, if someone had to ask me who was the greatest Kenyan musician, I would definitely say Ayu Bogada. Because he was true to himself with this uh, musical instrument, which was the Nyatiti. So please reconnect yourself. You know, how, coming from different tribes, I don't know what, 42 or 43 or whatever, it's not a bad thing. It's only politicians that use tribe as, uh, negatively. It's very good to belong to a tribe. Go back to your roots. Find what the culture was. Go to the villages and bring that village music, bring it into Nairobi to create, to enhance the Nairobi sound that we are talking about. And some of the problems that we have had before is that uh, our, it sounds like a cliche, but it's not. Our, our, our history has been oral. And people, when they die, they die with the history. And that's why I, as Catable Music, I've tried really to uh, capture this. Like this book is from 1946. It, it has got every uh, details how our music, where it came from. For example, if I will tell you about rumba music, the Congolese have rumba, but we also have our own rumba. Our own rumba came from World War II, and this guy is called Fundi Konde. Fundi Konde was born in 1924 and came up with, uh, uh, with the rumba music. In Congo, the father of Congolese music is called Wendo Kolosoi, Papa Wendo, who was born in 1925. So you see that Fundi Konde was even older than Wendo. Wendo's first hit song was called Marie Louise. 
That was 1948. Fundi Kondi's first hits was 1944. But because the Congolese have been very dynamic, they have captured properly what their rumba is. Like even the other day, they were recognized by UNESCO. Our rumba, we left it. Fundi Kondi they, this, uh, died. Nobody even recognized him. I worked with Fundi Kondi. I was, uh, at that time, was, was recording at High Fidelity. I was young and stupid. I said, ah, this old man, what does he know? Now I said, oh my goodness. So this was, it has a great person. So don't, you, you try to think about history. Because today, if you're if you studying classical music, you will know about Beethoven, uh, Mozart, you see? If you're if you a fan of reggae, definitely you know about Bob Marley, Toots, and uh, Peter Tosh. You will know them. If you like Congolese music, of course you'll know about Franco, Tabule, Cabasele. Uh, but when you meet young Kenyans, who are the artists before you? They have no clue and they don't care. And that's, what, that's our problem. So please go back to your roots. And if you, if you have time, read this book. It will really teach you a lot about your history, I mean, cultural history. And it was my pleasure being here, and thank you very much. Wow. So, you know, we were supposed to talk about uh, artists, m performers, traditional music, the ethical implications around uh, sampling, but I feel like Kasiva is right, you know. Um, I think we needed to talk about East African identity and Kenyan identity beforehand, and I'm glad we got to do that um, and to get a lot of the history as well. So thank you again to our three panelists. This was really insightful. Um, thanks to Goethe and GIZ for making this possible. Um, and thank you to James, our technical officer, and uh, thank you to every one of the SEMA students here. Another round of applause, thank you. <laughs>